Uh, good evening and welcome to the Society of Labour Lawyers webinar on housing and COVID-19. Uh, my name is Catherine Atkinson, I'm Secretary of the Society of Labour Lawyers and we have a fantastic panel for you this evening. We have Thangam Debonair, who's the MP for Bristol West and for the last month has been the Shadow Secretary of State for Housing. We have Liz Davies, our uh, the very own uh, chair of our housing law group and barrister at Garden Court Chambers. We have Councillor Amanda Pinnock with us this evening uh, from the Labour Housing Group and is also a housing law solicitor working in the voluntary sector. And we have Tom Zagoria, the co-founder of the Labour Homelessness Campaign, who also works in homelessness provision. So a lot of expertise uh, in the room this evening. Uh, and uh, well, after they've after we've heard from them, we will be taking questions and contributions from participants in the webinar, the webinar even. And if you can, as, as always, put your hand up, then we'll be able to stick your microphone on and, and get you on the camera so that you can ask your question. But I think this evening we are going to start with Liz Davies. Catherine, thank, thank you very much indeed. And congratulations, because you're turning out an awful lot of these webinars. There was one last night, and it's really welcome um, in these very strange times, not least because I think it's hugely important that we all stay in contact with each other and we're able to see each other um, and discuss ideas and so forth. And um, Thangam Debonair, it's, it's really lovely to have you coming to the Society of Labour Lawyers um, seminar, webinar. Um, congratulations on your appointment as Shadow Minister for Housing. Um, we really look forward to, to working with you and Society of Labour Lawyers, housing lawyers will provide whatever legal and practical assistance that we can on housing law issues. And we know that you've got a background particularly in um, domestic abuse campaigning. And of course, that's hugely timely given that the government has just agreed to an important amendment to the domestic abuse bill on homelessness, which I'll come on to. Um, I wanted to say a few words about what the government has been doing, first on evictions and then on homelessness, and then secondly on how really that's not good enough and to look at a bit about what, what Labour can be pushing for. Um, what I should say is that I, I'm a barrister. I, I end up seeing um, cases that are already um, in a great deal of dispute, as it were. They've gone a long way down the line. What I don't tend to see is coalface issues directly on the coalface, and I think both Amanda and Tom can fill us in as what's happening on the ground. Um, on possession and evictions, first of all, the government's announcement at the start of this crisis was that there would be a complete ban on evictions and additional protection for rent arrears. So they said on the 18th of March and sounded great, but the reality has not matched up to that. The complete ban on evictions was, um, took the form of, of two measures. One is that the period for service of a notice requiring possession has been extended from two months through a section 21 notice to three months. Um, and that applies to all other types of notices requiring possessions as, as well. But the most important one is in section 21. So now instead of two months notice, you have three months notice. It's a bit of a drop in the ocean, really. And the second thing that has happened, which was not from the government, um, but was actually from the judiciary, is that all possession claims and evictions using bailiffs and so forth have been stayed until at the moment, the 25th of June, um, the, the judges made a practice direction um, to that effect. Um, obviously, we'll wait to see if in early June they then extend that period. But at the moment, there are no possession cases taking place in the court and no evictions can happen through bailiffs until after, after the 25th of June. So that was really quite disappointing. The government points to a couple of other things that they say helps renters. One is that the local housing allowance um, calculation of housing benefit is no longer frozen. It's been frozen for the last four years. That was a measure that was coming in anyway, and that helps the bottom 30% of renters a little bit, um, but it's not going to help somebody who's suddenly finding themselves in financial 
crisis but isn't necessarily able to claim housing benefit or their rent is far more than housing benefit. And Robert Jenrick said in evidence on Monday, 4th of May, that they're going to bring in a pre-action protocol for private landlords so that private landlords will be required in the future, as social landlords currently are, to give various um, notices in advance of their intention to seek possession on the grounds of rent arrears and they're supposed to be able to work with tenants in order to tackle the rent arrears rather than um, go to possession and so forth. And that's, you know, it's a good thing, but it's not exactly bringing in major protection for rent renters. It's not going to stop people getting erected on the grounds of, of rent arrears. The big problem is that in the course of this crisis with people not being paid, being furloughed, not able to work and so forth. Um, the, the bottom line is that anybody who is renting will remain liable for their rent. And if they cannot afford the rent, then the rent arrears will build up. And during this period, landlords are in, entitled to serve their notices. When the notice period runs out, then after the 25th of June, they'll be in, entitled to bring possession proceedings and they undoubtedly will. The um, government produced guidance saying that landlords should be compassionate about rent arrears, but that's not legally enforceable in any, in any way at all. Um, and we've, we've yet to see whether landlords have been compassionate about rent arrears, but the bottom line is tenants remain liable for their rent. On top of that, we still have section 21 no fault evictions, which of course, both Labour and the Conservatives have promised to abolish and it was in the Queen's speech. The government are committed, say they're committed to abolishing it, but that hasn't happened yet. And the worry is that after the 25th of June, with a huge increase of rent arrears, landlords are just going to rely on the Section 21 process. They're going to go for no fault eviction. Legally, they will be entitled to do so. Legally, the tenant will have no defence to raise the fact that the arrears, the reason why the landlord wants possession is because of arrears that were accrued because of this crisis is completely irrelevant to a claim for Section 21. And so it really is important that we try and press for the abolition of Section 21 to happen quickly and to become effective um, as soon as the crisis lifts. The other thing on possession is, of course, there remains ground eight the mandatory ground for possession if you're in eight weeks arrears at the time when the notice is served and then still in eight weeks arrears um, at the court date then the court has no um, flexibility but to make a possession order it's a mandatory claim for possession um, and so there's a very good argument to say that government should be suspending ground eight for arrears incurred due to the crisis that doesn't stop a landlord from recovering possession because of rent arrears, because you still have discretionary grounds for rent arrears, grounds 10 and 11. Um, possession orders can still be made for rent arrears if there's a good reason to do so. But grounds 10 and 11 allow the court to look at a tenant's personal circumstances, why the arrears accrued. And they also have the flexibility of making a suspended possession order if the tenant has a reasonable plan to repay the arrears. You don't get suspended possession orders with ground eight. So there's a very real argument for saying that ground eight should not be used, and the government will have to legislate for this, should not be used for arrears that accrue um, as, a result, as a result of this crisis. Can I just say very quickly a couple of words about what the government's done on homelessness? Um, in many ways, that's a bit more positive because they did issue the letter on the 26th of March that required all local authorities to provide emergency accommodation to everyone who was at sleeping rough or at risk of sleeping rough. And of course, that is much, that goes much, much further than the legal obligations of homelessness in part seven of the Housing Act, where in order to get emergency accommodation, you need to have a priority need and you need to be eligible, which is based on immigration status, and the letter from the minister was very clear that because of public health reasons, then the requirement to provide emergency accommodation applied across the board, including to those people who may have no recourse for public funds would not be um, eligible. And so that was, that's really welcome. I understand that about 5,000 people have been accommodated un under this letter. Um, estimates of rough sleepers in normal times range 
from about 4,000, which everyone considers to be a considerable underestimate, to around 11,000. And so I expect Tom to say a bit more about how effective this intervention has actually been. Um, the, the, the legal issue about the, the, the letter is, of course, well, nobody really knows what its legal status is. It wasn't issued as statutory guidance. It wasn't issued under Part 7 of the Housing Act. If, therefore, you've got somebody who feels that they should be being accommodated under it, it's very unclear how they would enforce that right, whether it is a right to be accommodated and how they would enforce that right. I've had some cases where we threaten judicial review and so forth, and it's not come to anything because the local authority have, have agreed to accommodate. But that it's very unclear legally about what exactly that letter means. Um, I want just to end with this, which is something that Crisis said when the after the letter was published and after 4,000 rough sleepers had been accommodated over about a six day period. And they said, we literally went from a target of ending rough sleeping by 2025, which is the government's target. It's also um, Labour's committed to ending rough sleeping. We went from that target um, of ending it by 2025 to doing it over the weekend. And crisis said, if we can do that in a pandemic, then why on earth can't we do that in normal times? And what would be an amazing thing to come out of this crisis if, would, would be if this country realised that actually we could be in a position where we could provide emergency accommodation to everybody so as to allow anyone who was at risk of rough sleeping to get back on their feet and to be able to find permanent accommodation and we actually started to tackle the crisis of homelessness once and for all and not just dur dur during a pandemic. So I hope that's helpful. Catherine, I'm very happy to answer questions when we get to it. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Liz. Uh, if I can now go on to, to Councillor Amanda Pinnock from the, the Labour Housing Group. Good evening. Can you hear me? We can. Lovely. Excellent. So Liz, that was uh, very interesting. You know, it's, it's, I think it's important that we understand the legal aspect of how things have uh, developed since COVID-19 has come in and how it's impacted on people on, on the ground. And it's nice to meet everybody else here uh, today on this Zoom meeting. So uh, hi, everybody, and thank you for inviting me. I wear a number of hats. I'm a um, housing solicitor, uh, I'm a councillor, and also an exec member of the Labour Housing Group. And as a as a solicitor, I work for a third sector uh, organisation, a, a charitable organisation that represents uh, people obviously at risk of homelessness. So I do do a lot of work at the courts and we run a duty scheme at uh, Huddersfield County Court and Wakefield County Court. So I'm on that cold face where people come in, you know, to explain the circumstances that they're in and we get to see obviously the documentation such as the notices that they bring in. But what I can say is before COVID-19, there was a high number of possession proceedings anyway. People were already struggling financially because of and resulting in rent arrears because of things like benefits issues, universal credit and so on, benefit cap, particularly in the north of the country. So we already saw, you know, a high level of eviction proceedings. And what worries me, as Liz has pointed out, is that this is going to be compounded even more um, when we you know, come out of the lockdown or there's a relaxation. Um, I'm still dealing with possession cases or working from home and the courts have been in contact with us. And what they've said, particularly in the north, is that um, we've received orders indicating that there is a stay until we commence in the 27th of June. And at that stage, there'll be a review of each of the cases. And what the courts want us to do is each party to write in within seven days of that stay to, sort of, to give a summary as to what position the case is in. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens after the 27th of June, how the court is likely to, to treat these things, partic particularly in relation to warrants. Um, I have a number of clients at the moment who are in limbo in terms of, you know, they have a possession order they're on the council's waiting list to be rehoused and in this region i'm sure it's happening everywhere else the local authority have suspended um, the housing allocation scheme so it's not clear at the moment when that's going to resume 
and how it's going to be impacted by um, the relaxation of the courts, for example, issuing warrants. So we're yet to see how, how that's going to work. But what we have seen as well is that um, social housing, housing providers like the council um, and uh, you know, housing associations are being quite relaxed about how they, they deal with their tenants in rent arrears. And I, I have been in, in you know, discussing it with this local authority about you know, how they're dealing with the situation. And what they're saying to us is that they're working with tenants wherever possible, you know, they're accepting, even if it's not the full amount, they're accepting a token payment towards the arrears. They're also working with tenants now getting universal credit because of, um, you know, the new scheme of getting people onto it, whether they're unemployed and making sure that um, they're, they are uh, signed up to the uh, alternative payment arrangement um, so that payments are coming through. But there was an, an announcement last week from the government about third party deductions being suspended, which is causing us some concern because a lot of the tenants that we deal with that are on universal credit in relation to rent arrears, there is an arrangement in place where there is a third party deduction which is taken from their universal credit, which is paid to the landlord to cover rent arrears payments. And often suspended orders are based on that arrangement. So if the third party deduction isn't in place anymore, then we have a situation where they could be falling deeper into arrears, especially where the housing element doesn't cover the full rent, but also in terms of breaching suspended orders. And we worry that that could result in an avalanche of you know, warrants being issued uh, once a lockdown uh, is reduced. Is, um, in place so that, that's a real issue for us and also as i've mentioned the local authority has suspended the allocations uh, scheme so there are people at the moment who are in a priority band and um, hoping to be rehoused through the council but that can't happen at the moment and it's not clear when it will happen and how it will happen once the, the, the lockdown is reduced so there's those issues at the, at the moment that especially the local authority uh, and my organization are trying to um, reconcile. And as I've said, I'm a counsellor as well. I'm not going to go into too much detail about that because time is very limited. But I also wanted to talk about the Labour Housing Group because that's the reason why I've been invited today to talk about the work that, you know, who they are, the work that they have been doing and what they're hoping to um, achieve, especially, um, you know, during COVID and post-COVID. So for those who don't know, the Labour Housing Group are a socialist society who work with the Labour Party to develop socialist housing policies and feed into the Labour Party uh, manifesto. And at present we're working with Thangham, so it's nice to, to meet Thangham for the first time. And I know she's working with um, some of my colleagues at the moment, doing some really important work. So it's great to see that. And, and obviously we get a lot of feedback on what's taking place. The local housing group support uh, Labour Party candidates in the local and national elections, raise awareness on ongoing issues, on social media platforms. We also create publications and newsletters and uh, send resolutions to the conference and hold, hold fringe meetings. I'm not sure if anyone here has ever been to any of our fringe meetings, but they're excellent. So hopefully you can get yourself to the next one if you're at the conference. We publish two books. I don't know if anyone here has read any of those books. Right to a House and The Roof Over Your Head. Uh, that's definitely worth a read. And Obviously, we do a lot of campaigning. Um, last year, we particularly campaigned to get rid of Section 21. And we're so pleased to hear that the government um, announcing that that will be adopted. As Liz said, with, with all these things going on with COVID-19, we don't know how soon that's going to come into place. It may be kicked into the long grass. We don't know we're yet to see. Um, but we know also before COVID-19 that we had a broken housing market. And of course, this is really going to compound the situation even more. And we recognise there is a lack of affordable housing, unreachable mortgages for young people. There's a lack of security of tenure, rent arrears and the impact of universal credit and welfare benefits issues on people. The lack of social housing and the increase in expensive private rented properties, particularly in the south of the country. There's a housing shortage, increase in homelessness, increase in child poverty, 
um, fuel poverty, north and south divide and regional differences. That's something that um, we're very, very mindful of. And I think it's really good that the group has a nice eclectic mix of people from various backgrounds, but from various regions in the country. So we're able to bring that to the table and talk about how it impacts on us um, or impacts on the area in particular. OK, and um, also the need to improve um, housing standards and the working poor. And that's just to name a few that we're really mindful of. Um, you know, while we're working towards finding a resolution. So in light of COVID-19 then, we're driving key topics and calling on the government to take the following actions. To open up hotels and other empty buildings to house all homeless, to suspend rent and mortgage liabilities for anyone affected by COVID-19. We know there's been the suspension for 90 days, but even once we've come out of the 90 days, that's still not going to be enough for a lot of people who have been affected. Also to scrap the five day week waiting for universal credits and housing benefit and to suspend all benefit sanctions. And due to millions living in overcrowded, unsuitable, affordable housing, we need immediate action to build 100,000 council homes um, at social rent. Also to increase the how local housing allowance um, for uh, working households so that they can take up decent private rented properties and remove all caps. And to require any buy-to-let landlord who, ag who agrees a mortgage holiday with their lender to pass this on to the tenant in the form of a rent holiday. It's only fair, I think, in these circumstances for that to happen. And to provide one-off payments of local housing allowance or discretionary housing benefit for those who fall into arrears due to income difficulties. And also due to the inadequacies of LASPO, which is something that we seem to talk about a lot in housing, but is crucial to ensure that there is full access to justice in housing related cases and to ensure that the vulnerable have the legal, rack, the legal advice and assistance they need to fight injustice. And that sufficient um, emergency powers and funding is available to all local authorities to address these issues. It has to come from bottom up. Um, this is what we think that the local authority have the tools and the resources necessary to be able to implement these things. So those are the issues that the Labour Housing Group are pushing for and working with Thang and her excellent team to highlight and to try to achieve. And that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. It is, it is really good to be able to be um, sharing the webinar this evening with other members of the Labour Housing Group. I chair the social societies executive there are 21 different social societies and it's good when we can work together because we we all have the the same aims and, and desires for our communities and uh to, and it's it's great to, to share and collaborate um we're now moving on to to tom you can tell us more about the the labor campaign on homelessness as well brilliant thanks very much and uh, and thanks very much for organizing this i mean uh, apart from anything else i feel i've learned quite a lot from liz and amanda already um so yeah, I, I guess I'd start by, actually I want to pass on uh, to all of you an incident which was, was passed on to me uh, by a rough sleeper in Westminster quite recently. One of them uh, rang me, someone who we'd been working with previously, and he said that um, basically a, a police van pulled up to a group of rough sleepers who'd been staying outside the Westminster station. Um, seven police officers came out, told the rough sleepers there that they were a public health risk. Um, which, I mean, I suppose it's true, we're all public health risks at the minute, aren't we? But um, this is language that has been used towards these rough sleepers for years, long before the pandemic started. Um, and they were all told to move on. At least one of them was handcuffed. Uh, and when several of the rough sleepers who had been told to actually stay there to wait for accommodation because they weren't eligible for priority need, they weren't eligible for a local connection unless they were found by outreach workers in that location. Uh, sleeping rough and they they said this is where their ex outreach are expecting us to be uh, they asked where they should move to and the police officer told them uh, we don't care just somewhere else so I think the there are in terms of the implementation of the government's guidance uh, around getting all rough sleepers in I mean the stated goal that's great that's fantastic and I think it's great that people are now realizing oh yes we could end homelessness tomorrow if we wanted to uh, but I'd say 
the implementation has left a lot to be desired in a lot of ways. Um, so basically, I would agree with Liz definitely that uh, it's it's interesting to see how this fits in with the legal parameters because we sort of replace the the hierarchies of priority need of the Care Act and the Homelessness Reduction Act and the Housing Act and all of that with just a sort of blanket statement, get everyone in. It feels like quite an extra legal situation, I guess. But what that has led to, in my experience at least, um, is whether or not people who are sleeping rough are getting accommodated is basically down to luck. There's definitely a postcode lottery. Uh, some local authorities are responding in very different ways to others. Some local authorities are keeping restrictions in place. Others are broadly taking most people in. Uh, there's often a lottery in terms of uh, the timing as well. I mean, just trying to help people get into accommodation. I've rung up a council's out of office housing support line. Uh, and one night they've said, no, we can't take that person in. They don't have a strong enough local connection. Uh, and then you try again the next night, it's someone else on duty. And they'll say, yeah, of course we'll take them in. Yeah, we've got this place to accommodate them. And quite often it's just down to the resources that the councils have because they're right now trying to find uh, accommodation which isn't a crowded hostel that people can stay in for three days. It's, it's a self-isolating accommodation, whether it's a hotel room or something else that people would stay in for at least two weeks. And there is a very limited supply of that because the government has not given them any support in acquiring more properties. Uh, they can't access all of the, you know, the 10 billion pounds worth of empty homes in London, for example. Um, and so it's just down to whether there is the supply of housing to meet the demand on that night. That is, that, that is what determines whether or not someone is actually going to get accommodated. Uh, so, I mean, there's, there's plenty of stories that, that I've got. I work in a, uh, in a shelter in Harangi. We had uh, last week a rough sleeper come in uh, who was on crutches. He'd just been discharged from hospital. He asked for support. Uh, we couldn't give him support there because we didn't have any space, but we, uh, we tried to refer him to the housing line. And despite the fact that we all knew him, that we knew that he'd been sleeping in the borough for the last 10 years. He wasn't, uh, he, they said on the housing support line, he didn't have a strong enough local connection um, because he, he couldn't put his name to having had a tenancy in the past. And given that the government guidance is that broadly implies at least that local connection rules shouldn't be a bar to people sleeping rough, certainly not if they don't have a local connection to anywhere else either. Um, it just seems absurd that, that this is a situation that's still continuing. I've got plenty of other stories, people who are uh, sort of domestic abuse victims who are denied support because they uh, haven't filled in the correct forms and they're told to stay with the abuser until they can fill the forms in correctly or they're or sleep rough. Uh, we've had quite people in quite a few boroughs who are denied support because they have no recourse to public funds, uh, despite, as, as Liz said, the the guidance from central government implying at least that that shouldn't be a bar because obviously it's you know we need to get everyone off in any case but the how councils are interpreting it is really depending on a sort of day-to-day -day. Uh, it's depending on whether the person can get legal support from all sorts of excellent organizations which are providing that um, and it's depending on which borough they happen to be in uh, because so many boroughs are so stretched for resources right now, they're so dependent. The, the, you know, the central government funding has been nowhere near enough that those drives to keep the problem somewhere else and to, if at all possible, you know, shift or shove a rough sleeper into another local authority where they can be picked out by another council's overstretched homelessness budget reserves uh, rather than their own, those pressures are still there because of, frankly, the government's sort of divide and rule strategy for how they want homelessness policy to be carried out. So uh, yeah, I would say that while it's been very good in a lot of ways, uh, I mean, there've been a lot of accomplishments, certainly 5,000 people taken off the streets is, uh, is no mean feat, um, but there is, there is a lot left to do. Um, and we haven't seen the clarity from central government that's needed around no recourse to public funds, around local connection rules, around all of these other restrictions on support which have been there for a long time, and which council is still using because they just don't have the resources to ignore them. Uh, I mean, there are cases where I think they need to do a bit more. Uh, I'd say most of those cases of people getting turned away that I mentioned earlier were in Labour councils. Uh, and we as a group are a group of Labour members and activists who are campaigning in those councils 
oftentimes to, to push them to do more, to, to push them uh, to, to provide, to be model labor councils, putting socialist values into action. Um, but clearly there is a lack of resources. Um, and I think everyone can, can agree on that. And that's clearly a demand that we need to make of central government is that they can't just pretend that the last 10 years of austerity didn't happen. And they can't just, you know, leave councils to do overnight, fulfill this massive duty of ending homelessness without actually giving nearly enough support that's, that's needed. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely interested in, in hearing uh, other people's views as well on, on how this is going to fit in with uh, duties under the Homelessness Reduction Act going forward and how we can turn the extra legal uh, urgency of getting everyone into accommodation and turn that into actual legal rights that people have um, to be inside. I think that's, that's something that, that we need to focus on. Um, Thank you. I, Oh, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm conscious we're halfway through our time and it's always great if we can squeeze as many questions and contributions um, uh, in the end as well. We have had a couple of uh, questions messaged, but it's much better when people ask themselves rather than um, everyone being stuck hearing my voice. Uh, but we have got one final speaker and it's fantastic to have Plangam Debonair, our, our Shadow Secretary of State for Housing, with us this evening. Um, well, thank you, Catherine, and thank you, Joe, for inviting me, and thank you to everybody. Um, it's an absolute joy to be working with you all, and also to see on the participants list quite a few um, colleagues I know already, and, and others that I'm sure I'm going to get to know. Um, I think it's fair to say I was shocked when Keir offered me a position in Shadow Cabinet. I think I thought that I might stay as a Labour Whip, which I've been very happy for the last three and a half years. I actually think being a Labour Whip is one of the best jobs in politics. I have to say it's now been overtaken by being Shadow Secretary of State for Housing um, because the reason I took up Keir's um, offer, apart from the fact that I was just pleased, um, is because I want everybody to have a home that is safe, affordable, uh, secure, on the tenure that is secure for them as well as secure physically, um, that is in an area where they can walk or use public transport to get to work and to measure and for education, all the things that we as Labour members, we all, we all know that we want this. But being appointed to do this job in the middle of a COVID crisis has been quite extraordinary because um, as some of you have already alluded to, the country has taken a collective decision to say, A, nobody should be homeless, brackets in a crisis. And I think our job now as Labour politicians is partly to get rid of the brackets and just say, actually, nobody should be homeless, full stop. And to take on crisis as challenge there. But in order to do that, of course, you wouldn't start from here. Um, you wouldn't start from 10 years of austerity. You wouldn't start from a broken housing market. You wouldn't start from an affordability crisis that's been going on for some time that's got all sorts of reasons behind it, all of which, in my view, are fixable, um, but all of which need us to take not just a political decision as a country that we think all forms of homelessness are wrong and fixable and should be fixed, but also that the housing market needs fixing because housing shouldn't just be a roof over your head. It should also be a secure, safe, affordable, appropriately tenured roof over your head and in a home in which the energy sources are renewable and we can meet our climate change targets. So my job twofold I think at the moment, one is to scrutinise everything the government's doing on COVID and that means uh, so quite a lot of the things that people including people on this call have already said you know section 21 the government's already agreed that that's the right thing to do it's in the Queen's speech they should be doing it now rather than waiting it's, you know that's there um, I think they've probably got a draft bill ready to go. I worry about what the caveats are, but the sooner we get working on it, the better. Uh, the second thing is uh, my predecessor, John Healy, already announced before I took over, uh, and I continue to support this as Labour policy, that not only do we want to scrap Section 21, but we want to, for the life of this crisis, scrap not just actually Grounds 8, but also 10 and 11 being used as a reason for session orders. Now, I just want to clear up something. Um, this has been interpreted by some people that um, we were calling for a rent waiver, and that's not what John was calling for, to be clear. What John was calling for was to make sure that the law was tight enough so that being in arrears because of the COVID crisis shouldn't mean that you lose your home and that you should then have two years to repay. And the draft legislation that we worked on with some Labour lawyers 
is what provides for that and I'm really happy to discuss that afterwards. But also on top of that, we want people to be able to have decent income. So we, we thought there needs to be some sort of furlough scheme and the government eventually agreed. We thought there needs to be support for self-employed people. The government eventually agreed. We've also um, shown them where the gaps are. Now there, they're not being quite so cooperative, but we think one of the gaps is that universal credit is various things you can do to improve it and the five week wait get rid of the benefit cap, get rid of the two child limits and raise the local housing allowance if possible and if needed. So um, we think there's a range of things that the government could do in order to prevent the need for arrears, um, as well as providing protection so that arrears in themselves can't be used as a reason for eviction. And we think there's all sorts of things you could do about that. And I'm also concerned about what happens to the people at the end of the uh, crisis when I cannot envisage a world in which hotel managers have to say to people staying in their hotels, everybody out. I can't, I can't envisage that world and I want us all to collectively agree not to envisage that world. But the missing link for a lot of councils, and I've been talking to councils, and I have a lot of time for the struggles Labour councils are going through, because they tend to be the ones who suffered most under the cuts to local authority funding, they tend to be the ones who have the most complex needs. They tend to be the ones where for quite shamelessly political reasons, the central government has put additional pressures and given them extra costs. I don't want those local authorities just to be told, you need to fix this without actually central government looking at what that's gonna cost. And also, that's not just about roof. That's got to be about adequate move on accommodation and then move on from the move on accommodation and the wraparound support. We all know on this call, all housing specialists know, all homelessness campaigners know that housing first as a principle is a good principle. But in order for that to work, you need the drug and alcohol services, you need the mental health services, you need uh, the death advice services, you need all the things which we all know have been cut drastically over the last few years. But what I'm not going to do is take a pop at Labour councils for not being able to do what they don't have the money to do when some of them are already very close to the edge financially and we know that. What I want us to do is to say to the government really clearly, this was a good thing that you decided to do and we want you to carry on doing this good thing and here are the ways that you could do this good thing. Um, so that's my initial job. Obviously my long-term job uh, is to work out how housing policy can contribute to us winning the general election in 2024, but more importantly, once we win it, actually following through on my aim, your aim, which is to make sure that everybody in this country, no matter who they are, has a decent home that's affordable, of the right tenure, that's secure, and that is fueled by renewable energy so that we meet our climate change targets. So that's a lot of long-term work. In the short term, we're going to be talking a lot, I would have thought, about some of the challenges for how we get past the COVID crisis in both homelessness provision and for people in the rented sector. I just want to add a caveat. One of the people I can see on the participants list has, has helped me to get a, a grip on this. There are, trick, there are tricky problems associated with the rent ban. So if you are a local council who's got social borders at the moment on a property where there are people who are doing very dangerous things, such as, for instance, county lines or other forms of drug dealing, you need to be able to find a way to follow through and actually evict those people. So if we just have a complete ban and we call for a complete ban without any way through that for those very specific circumstances, then we also risk causing other harms. And that's a good example of someone working with me over the last few weeks to say, look, these principles are sound. We don't want people to lose their homes, but we don't want unintended consequences that could also be harm. So I'm really interested to hear people's ideas and thoughts on that and I'm also and, and any other ways in which there might be unintended consequences that could hurt the people we're trying to help. So thank you. I hope we're going to get questions. We do. Everyone ignored my plea for hands up and asking their questions themselves. We have had a lot of written questions. Uh, I'm going to try and summarise as I read and get in as many as possible. What I what I will do is ask that our panellists try and take a note of the questions and I'm going to ask for responses and closing remarks so we can get as many of the questions um, in as possible and contributions in as possible. Um, uh, but I understand we also now have um, lots of hands up as well, which is exactly what we want um, and that is great. I think that while we are while we've got the hands um, going up and that's being lined up, I'm going to read a couple of the questions. The first one that had come in was from Cal Corkery, who said here in Portsmouth, the council is now housing nearly 200 rough sleepers who previously would have been in the night shelter 
or out on the streets, how can we ensure these people aren't chucked out of the hotels with nowhere to go when the lockdown ends? Um, we've also had um, a couple of questions from, from Sheila Spencer, the first of which was about the private rental sector and what can be done in the immediate future and in the long term future uh, about people being asked to leave because of fears that they could bring the virus home. And I think she was particularly um, concerned and shocked that many just agree to do so. Uh, we've got a couple of contributions on the country's chronic housing shortage and wanting that to return to frontline politics. Um, and especially with the, the concern of continuing rising house prices. Uh, we have a, a contribution from Sally Hughes about street homeless. Uh, and, and she would like to ask about the future of some of the emergency measures. As Sangam says, we wouldn't start from here. Charitable and voluntary sector organisations in the field do not have support once their clientele are housed. So a whole infrastructure of support could disappear and hotels are not suitable long-term housing. Um, so we do have a number of others but I want to come to our uh, our speakers. I think our first one we've got is is Dermot uh, McKibben. Oh, Dermot. Uh, right, hello. Um, I'm a retired uh, housing advisor. I'm particularly interested in leaseholders the Select Committee on Housing have published this afternoon their survey into uh, cladding issues on leaseholders. Now, these people will, have, will be expecting to pay large service charges bills for those costs. And if uh, there, there's a danger of those people being made bankrupt, if they're a police officer, um, they could lose their jobs. I think politically, it's important for Labour to support these leaseholders because they are... Uh, 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 that uh, owner occupiers more owner occupiers vote Tory than than Labour. Thank you very much, Dermot. I think we're going to have to keep the contributions really quick, or else we're not going to have time for the responses. I think our next one is from Ben Clay. Ben, thank you. Um, great to speak to many of you, as I have done before. Um, a quick point on something that we've been working on at Tenants Union UK, along with uh, Gone Court Chambers North and the Greater Manchester Law Centre, um, regarding some changes to legislation around Section 8 and Section 21. Now, one of my colleagues has recently suggested um, that in order to maintain the protections that have been built up around gas safety certificates, for example, with Section 21, that those could be novated uh, and that you could basically roll those all into one ground of possession for rent arrears uh, but that you wouldn't lose those other protections that have been built up around Section 21 by abolishing Section 21. wondered if our legal minds had an opinion on that. Thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker is, is Paul White. Paul. Hi, uh, I'm a councillor in, in uh, Wandsworth in London and we find it very difficult to uh, um, get information from, uh, from the council. But there seem to be this, this new... Uh, we, we, we've put people in hotels, we're also putting people into self-contained units and they seem to become available rather, rather you know, quickly as soon as the COVID-19 uh, crisis happened. Is there any idea that, that these are Airbnbs, all year, all year round Airbnbs who have suddenly become available and I mean surely we should be looking for, you know, to ban all, all, um, uh, in London certainly um, all year round Airbnbs and certainly I know that uh, 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 Mr Healy was working on uh, getting rid of the, uh, or, of sorry, of changing the empty properties management orders as well to, to be so we could bring the uh, empty properties back into use as well, which has been uh, talked about earlier on. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I'm just, I'm afraid that we really only have time for, for, for a couple of more um, in order to actually get the, the responses. So uh, if we can hear from, from John Perry and, and Roger Slaterly, I think that's going to be uh, it for this evening. But I hope this is the start of a, um, a, an ongoing conversation. So do we have, um, do we have Roger? Yes. Hello, Roger. Hello. 
Yes, I, uh, I am the acting secretary of uh, Uxbridge and South Ryslip CLP. Uh, my question is about the coming economic crisis. I think uh, we have, a, uh, I'm anticipating there's going to be a, a, a lot of people who are not going to be able to pay their, their rent, in, even in private uh, rental units. And, uh, and the question is, how can we, what should we be doing to prepare ourselves for that? here at the, at, the, at the CLP level to be able to support the national pressure that we need to extend the uh, no eviction. Thank you very much. And finally, John Perry. Uh, yes, yeah, John Perry from the Chartered Institute of Housing. Uh, I'm very interested in these measures that have been talked about to try and stop the tsunami of evictions that might occur because of rent arrears. And I think it would be very good if we could develop a sort of shopping list uh, which obviously will be something that would be very useful for Tangham, but it would be useful for those of us engaged in lobbying from other points of view as well, um, so that we could not only delay evictions, but perhaps uh, think of other measures. I think Tangham, you mentioned a two-year delay or a two-year period over which tenants could repay arrears. And I think we also need to think how, to, how do we mitigate the effects on local authorities and housing associations who find, whose finances will have been markedly stretched during this period. Thank you very much. I, I hope that we can actually come together again in the future to be able to, to, to review these because I'm conscious that there were lots of, of elements we couldn't get to. Uh, I'm going to just ask for, for answers and closing comments from each of our speakers, and I'd like to do it in the same order, if I may. Um, we're going to, I hope that as many questions will be answered as possible. But if we could start with, with Liz. Um, right, I'm, I'm, I'm unmuted, aren't I? You can hear me. Good. Oh, Thank me. you. Okay. Um, the, the broad point about hope that the homelessness measures once the crisis ends, what the questioners have said and the other speakers have said is, is absolutely right. There is ab no legal duty whatsoever that comes in when the crisis passes and when the local authorities cease to implement that letter. And the letter itself is not obviously a, le a legal duty, although it's not been um, litigated about at the, at the moment. Um, so the short answer is Cal, um, I, th I think it was um, Sally who made the same point. There's every reason to believe that um, in Thangam's words, hotel managers are going to be knocking on the door and saying to people, people should get out. And the only legal obligations as against moral and political obligations on local authorities will be to house those people who they have reason to believe may have a priority need and who they have reason to believe may be eligible for assistance. In other words, if somebody is clearly no recourse to public funds, even if they are very ill, um, and, and if somebody is clearly able-bodied in the, in the way that rough sleepers can be able-bodied, um, then they will not be accommodated. They, they will have no right to accommodation under, under homelessness legislation. So it is absolutely something that we should be pressing to say that anybody who is currently being accommodated should now be considered as having a priority need in the future. And at the very least, um, assessed for whether or not they have a priority need be before they are thrown out. But I would go further than that and would say that the measures in this letter allow us to say, why don't we look at the abolition of the priority need test altogether, which has happened in Scotland, where the pressures on local authority when it comes to homelessness are less, I accept that, but Scotland have 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 shown the way forward. So that's what I would say about homelessness. And of course, Paul in Bristol has just said legal duties do not create new homes. Ab absolutely. I mean, you know, um, I'm, I'm not here to deal with the supply point, but the supply point is really crucial. Um, just on some of the possession points, the point then about there are various defences to a Section 21 claim, which include where a landlord has not provided a gas safety certificate, where a landlord indeed has not protected the deposit, where a landlord has not provided the energy performance certificate. And those are all only defences to Section 21 and not to claims for possession on other grounds. It's a good point that if we're abolishing Section 21, the government should be lobbied to make sure that those defences that are all about being proper, um, you know, decent landlords 
um, then apply to, to other possession claims as well. In terms of the, John, as you said, the tsunami of likely possession claims on the grounds of rent arrears, I, th I think you're right. And I think it would be very, very helpful if all sorts of groups, and I can talk to Catherine about whether the Society of Labour Lawyers can coordinate this, um, can put together the shopping list. I have to say the draft legislation that John Healy, I think it was his sort of last act as shadow housing minister, um, produced was very good indeed about no evictions on the basis of, of, of rent arrears incurred because of COVID for, for two years. Um, and so that would be a good, a good starting point. Um, finally, can I just say, oh, sorry, I wanted to make one other, uh, one other point, which is the point, what Tom was saying very dramatically about how local authorities, despite the letter, are refusing to accommodate people if they say there isn't a local connection or you belong to another local authority, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, one understands the pressures on local authorities and, and the financial pressures for all the reasons that Sangham um, set out. But even under the existing law, regardless of the letter, local connection has never been a, a reason for refusing to give somebody emergency accommodation. The most that can happen with local connection is that somebody needs to be assessed and then may be referred on. So you need to be really tough about this gatekeeping provision of saying go away if he doesn't have a local connection. That's not just ambiguous, that's actually wrong in law. And if anybody in that position gets to an advisor, the advisor needs to be really tough on it. Can I just end by saying this, that the um, housing law subgroup of the Society of Labour Lawyers is holding a similar webinar on the 19th of May, which is a Tuesday, at either five o'clock or six o'clock, I can't remember, but the invite can, will, will go out tomorrow. And we're looking very specifically about um, rent issues and possession claims on the basis of rent arrears and advice for renters in COVID-19. So you would all be very welcome to that. And Sangam, we know that your time is incredibly um, busy, but if one of your special advisors wants to join in that call, um, if you're unable to join us, you'd be very welcome. But if one of your special advisors could come, then they would also be very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Amanda, I think you should just take your yes. mute off. Great. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. I think Liz has done really well to answer a lot of the questions. There's, there's, I think there's very little um, left for me to specifically deal with. Um, I think the first question about um, homeless people who are housed now being thrown out when uh, COVID is relaxed. I think Liz is right. It has to be about legislation. There has to be something put in place to protect these people going forward. But also looking at it from a, a local authority point of view, there has to be the funding in place to make sure that local authorities can support these individuals. So there has to be, you know, funding in place, but also there has to be the housing available. Um, and in many areas, there is a lack of housing. And some of the housing that is available, private rented housing, for example, is expensive. So there has to be everything else that goes along with it. So, you know, the local housing allowance is what Thangan was talking about before and making sure other elements come together so it's sustainable. I think that that's a crucial issue. So there's a little point in moving people into private rented accommodation if they can't afford to maintain that because they're going to get themselves in the same predicament where they're going to be evicted. So I think all those things need to be considered together. Um, the gentleman asked about CLP and how they can uh, prepare in relation to no evictions. I think the important things for CLPs is to ensure that Labour Party members and other residents understand what's going on. I think this is a real crucial issue that everybody needs to be aware of and get behind. So I think once people realise what the, the crucial issues are, then it may be something that they're willing to, to campaign. And I think it's important for us to go out and campaign about door knocking, speaking to residents about what's going on. So raising that awareness is key raising it in CLP, raising it in branches, raising it on the doorstep when you're speaking to residents. And you'll be surprised what residents tell you about their circumstances or you know, circumstances in relation to people who they know. So for me, that, that, that's what it's about. Um, let's see. Delaying evictions for two years is an interesting one. Um, yes, it's something that would very much be welcomed, 
but also I think we need to look at it from the point of view of the landlords. What we're finding in the north, and it's probably happening in the south as well, is that landlords are um, being affected financially by rent arrears. On some occasions, they are also victims. So we're finding landlords, for example, uh, having to go bankrupt or they're losing their properties because of mortgage arrears and so on. So I think even though we do need to protect the tenants, we also need to be mindful of how these things are going to impact on the homes. Because what we want to make sure is that these private rented property, properties are still available. We don't want to discourage landlords from, you know, um, not dealing with tenants who, for example, on benefits, for example, and using those things as an excuse. So it's important that all these things are thought about, you know, when going forward. Thank you very much, Tom. Thanks very much. Uh, I'll, I know we're pressed for time, so I'll just go quickly. I think most of the questions have been covered, but I want to address on the, uh, the questions about street homelessness and those who are, who are currently in hotels. I think uh, Sally raised the point of street homelessness, and I, I would add to what I said earlier about the funding available is that it's really unclear what the, risk, like the, what the funding is for. I know uh, Andy Burnham in Manchester said recently that the funding is only for people who were previously known to local authorities on the streets prior to the pandemic beginning. And so for these really overstretched budgets, for a start, there's loads of people who aren't known to local authorities because it's often quite difficult to be known to local authorities. You have to have been found out sleeping rough. And uh, oftentimes people don't want to be found when they're, when they're on the streets. But then secondly, at least uh, you know where I'm at, we're seeing huge numbers of people, a real spike in the number of people becoming homeless right now uh, because they were sofa surfing before or because they were, they were subletting and they've been evicted, whatever the, the eviction bans that have been put in place. And that spike is obviously going to continue after the pandemic is over. So we might see a huge, massive increase in the number of people needing homelessness support without that uh, funding for local authorities. I think it's also a really important point that Cal raised um, around ensuring that those who have been housed aren't chucked out, particularly if they're in hotels and there's going to be a lot of pressure uh, to put, I suppose, profit before people. And uh, we've not seen any guarantees that people who are uh, being placed in accommodation now won't be evicted after that's over. So I guess the point I'd raise on that is that, well, we know two things. First of all, uh, the Tories are in government and we know that they're not going to have the interests of, of the most vulnerable necessarily at heart and how hard we're going to fight now to make sure that Thangam is housing secretary and in four years time uh, the the tools that are at our disposal aren't going to be a Labour government changing legislation right now we have to force that legislation we know that people have believed that moral argument that everyone deserves a home now we have to force that to actually get to legislation or only going to do that through the sort of bottom-up action through uh, you know when the pandemic is over evictions resistance of the kind that London Renters Union and others are doing through, uh, you know, organising protests and getting in the media and doing all those other things. So I think that's a key thing. Uh, you know, we need the evidence base. And I think Labour lawyers are, are great for helping us provide the evidence base of, of the legal changes that are required. Um, but we also need that grassroots mobilisation. And so, uh, yeah, check out the Labour homelessness campaign. Hopefully we'll be doing some of that going forward. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And um, last but certainly not least, Thangam. Okay, I'm just going to do a minute so that we can finish on time. And I wanted to just say about the way I work, because Amanda raised a really important point, and that's been part of the tussling I've been doing over the last few weeks, is how you structure this so that tenants don't end up having broken a contract and liable for other legal proceedings down the line and also that we don't break the housing market without having worked out how we're going to replace it. So we put in a two-year provision for repayment not because we think everyone will need it but because we want it to be there but there's a lot of detail in that uh, legislation and I'm glad Liz that you said it was well drafted. I've just been over it with the lawyers who drafted it this morning to try and work out what that would mean because I think for every time that we say we want everyone to be housed we still have to think about how and we have to remember where we're starting from starting from the market which is this it's got more private rented in it than maybe many people in this conversation would like however private rented is always going to play a part and it has a role and breaking it without thinking about what we're going to replace it with is also not an option as well as standing up for tenants i think it's possible to do both um, someone on the on the chat asked about manifesto commitments. So I just wanted to re to let everybody know that 
there'll be a general election in four years time. We don't know what the housing needs of this country are going to be in four years time. So I can't tell you that everything that was in in December will be in, in uh, May 2024 any more than everything that was in in December was exactly the same as what was in, in in 2010. But I can tell you that things that have been passed by the National Executive Committee as of today are still policy and that all the work that John did, none of it's been lost, all of it is still policy, all of it is work that I'm doing at the moment and all of which leads me on to the work that I really want to get on with which is trying to make all of these arguments and at the same time making the arguments about counter-cyclical investment in housing and house building being the answer to some of the knotty problems that we've raised. So the knotty problems of where do you put people when they've been in hotels and there's no move on accommodation rather than just clobbering Labour councils actually give them find ways for there to be the money for them to do the things that Labour councillors already know how to do and make sure that we're not just moving a problem like a sort of lump under the carpet further down and creating other problems for us later on. Counter-cyclical investment in housing, I think, is an amazing way to help kickstart the economy after what will be a really difficult economic time. And what's more, it could also be a way of getting an awful lot of people into much better jobs than the ones that they had been in previously. And I want to try and do all of that. And at the moment, as Tom said, we've got a Tory government, so we need to persuade them that they need to do all of that. But also at the same time, I think if they don't do all of it, and I can't see why they do all of it at least, that we will be in government in four years time to do that and I can't wait Amanda to be back on the doorstep it just sounds so alien at the moment we should be campaigning right now it should be get out the vote for locals tomorrow I feel a bit bereft on a sunny day so I'm actually in here looking at a computer screen and not talking to voters so I really hope that everybody is going to stay in touch and stay safe and that we will be out there on the doorstep making these arguments and campaigning very very soon and thank you ever so much for your time Thank you very much. Thank you so much to all of our, our panellists and, and everyone who has contributed and who has joined us this evening. Next week, the next webinar in our COVID-19 and Justice series is on domestic violence. And we are going to be joined um, by Shadow Minister for State for Domestic Violence and Safeguarding, Jess Phillips. So I think it will be, again, a really interesting conversation and we hope that many of you will be able to join us. Thank you. Good night.